Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem minimum fuel cost to report to the capital. This problem is really tricky, but I'll break down my thought process and then you'll kind of realize that it's not magic. There are logical steps that you can follow to solve these types of problems. So we are given a tree. Now it looks like a regular graph, but it will have the properties of a tree in that it will be a connected, undirected graph without any cycles. That's going to be really, really important. This graph doesn't have cycles. And we want to calculate the minimum fuel cost. Now, the way we calculate the cost is that this is our target position node zero and then every other node will basically need a path to connect it to node zero we know that's going to exist that path will exist this is a connected graph and there's not going to be any cycles in any of these paths but it's not as easy as calculating just like the entire edge length that would be really easy we would just say the total is three but we also have another restriction, which is the number of seats. I'm not going into the context of this problem because I don't think it really matters too much, but we need a path from every node to a node zero, which I guess I'll call the root. And I think this problem makes a lot more sense when you actually draw the graph as a tree, because now we can make things even more complicated, but it's not super complicated as I'm going to show you in just a second. So this is sort of our root node. And what we want is a path from every node to the root node. Now, to actually calculate the minimum fuel, I said we have another restriction, which is we have the number of seats. So for example, if we start at this node four, this node has a car that will drive it to the root node. Every node has a car that will do that for them. And then to calculate the fuel for every car, for every node, we will just have to get the path length. So for this one, the path length is one. For this one, the path length is one. For this, the path length is one. And for these two guys on the bottom, the path length will be two. But like I said, we have something called number of seats. If every car just has a single seat, then yes, we'll have to do it the way we just described. But what if every car actually has two seats? Well, for this node, it doesn't matter. The path that takes it to the root is length one, and this guy's not going to be visiting anybody else along the way. Same for both of these. What about these two nodes? When four is driving to the root node, why doesn't it just pick up this guy as well? Then we can just take one car that will drive both of them to the root. It's basically carpooling. Now, if this guy then also wants to drive to the root, he kind of has to go by himself because this person will already have been picked up. So then how should we actually compute the minimum fuel? Well, there's many approaches you might first think of, which could be depth first search from every single node, maybe from every single leaf node. Like from here, we actually create those paths and then calculate the fuel. But it's actually even easier than that. And the easiest way to recognize it is by, in my opinion, drawing it out like this because... There's never going to be any cycles. So for us to know the amount of fuel it takes for this guy to get to the root, we could also ask ourselves how much fuel does it take for the root to get to this guy. And when you start looking at it like this, then the sub problems become clear as well, because recursively, we don't want to have to keep track of every individual node and then calculating the total fuel is going to get complicated that way. Why don't we ask ourselves in terms of sub problems, how many people are going to be at this node that are going to travel from that node back to the root. It will never overlap with any of the other subtrees because remember, this is an acyclical graph. So however many people end up here, in this case, it's just one. And let's say our seat capacity is equal to two. There's one person here and they need to travel a distance of one. How much fuel is that going to take them? Well, we don't measure fuel based on people. We measure it based on cars. So what we'll do to get the number of cars that we need to get this person, we would just say one divided by the total number of seats, which is two, but that's going to round down and give us zero. So we actually want the math ceiling of this value, which is going to give us one. We're going to round up because we 
we want to know how many cars is it going to take to take this many people, one person. Now, if we wanted to take two people with a capacity of two, then we do two divided by two and then take the ceiling of that, which is just going to be one. What if we needed three people? Then we'd say three divided by two. Take the ceiling of that, we'd say we need two cars to take three people. That makes sense. So in this case, we need one car to take this person to the route. How much fuel does that take? Well, we take cars. And in this case, we're traveling a distance of one. So we take the cars and multiply that by one, which is just going to be the number of cars. And we only had a single car for this guy. So it takes one fuel to bring this node up to the root. Now, recursively, before we even do that, we would go to this node and say, well, how long is it going to take or how much fuel is it going to take to bring all of its children up to it? Now, of course, this guy doesn't have any children, so we didn't do that. But the easiest way to do this recursively is to do just like I'm saying by returning the total number of passengers up to the parent node. But we should also keep track of some global result variable or maybe some global fuel variable, a better name for it. And then we can update this within our recursive function. But finishing up the rest of this walkthrough, for two, we want to know how many passengers is it going to have that are going to need to go up to the route. Well, let's go to its children. We go down to four. How many passengers does four have? It doesn't have any children. So we're just going to return one up to the parent. And then same thing from five. We're going to return five up to the parent. So there's going to be two passengers that this is going to return to its parent. But before we even do that, how much fuel would it take to bring these guys up to this. Well, for each of them, we would do the same computation we did with this guy, which is we'd get one car for one person here, one car for one person here. For each of them to go up, it's going to take one fuel. So we'll have two total fuel that it took to bring them here. So we had two people here that we got from the children, but let's not forget about this guy. So we actually have three people here, which we are going to then return up to our parent. And then the parent is going to see three people, three divided by our capacity, which is two. That means it takes two cars to bring them and to go a distance of one with two cars. It's going to take two fuel to get there. Now, we haven't really been keeping track, but I think we're at about five total fuel by now. And then lastly, we'll have this guy, which is going to take one fuel to bring him to the route. So in total, we'll have six fuel for this problem, the minimum amount of fuel it would take in this case. That's pretty much the problem. As you can see, we're mainly just doing a depth first search starting from the root. So the overall time complexity is going to be big O of N. We're not using any extra memory, but in the worst case, we will have the call stack, which will be the height of the tree, which in the worst case will be log N if it's a balanced tree or just O of N if it's an unbalanced tree. So now let's code it up. So the first thing I'm going to do is build an adjacency list and I'm going to use a hash map called a default dictionary in Python where the default value is a list. So we're going to go through every edge in our roads. I guess that's what they're calling it here in roads. And for every source node, I guess calling them source and destination doesn't make sense in this problem because they are undirected. But we're going to do the same thing for every source and every destination, just appending its neighbor to the adjacency list. Then I'm going to have a result variable, which I'm going to initially set to zero. And that's the variable we're going to be returning. And we're going to be running a depth first search before we return the result. Within our depth first search, we're going to start at some node. We are going to use a second parameter, which is going to be the previous node. And you'll see why in just a second, but that's the only other parameter that we're going to need. And inside this DFS, we're going to declare our result variable as non-local because then when we actually update it within the DFS, we will be updating the value outside of here. Otherwise, we're going to get an error. But we will still have access to the adjacency list and everything else from out here within this function. But for the DFS, what we want to do, just as I mentioned, is total up the number of passengers. So initially, I'm going to set that to zero. And what this DFS is going to do is return the number of passengers. It's not going to return the result. We're going to be updating the result within here. But I think it's cleaner to write it this way with having like a global or non-local variable like this. Now for the node, finally, we're going to go through all of its children 
So for child in the adjacency list of this node. Now, the one thing we don't want is to get caught in a cycle. Now, since we don't have a connected graph, we're not gonna have real cycles here, but from a child, we should never be able to go back up to the parent. So maybe instead of calling this previous, I should call it parent. And if a child is equal to the parent, then we want to skip. Or rather, if this is not equal to the parent, then we want to actually execute our code here, which would be to run DFS on that child. And we're gonna pass in its parent, which is the current node that we are at. So we're gonna run DFS on here. It's gonna return the number of passengers from that child node. Let's assign that to P because we're gonna need it twice. One, obviously we want to take our current number of passengers and increment this by P, but also we want to be able to update our result. So how are we gonna update the result? Well, first of all, we're gonna get the number of passengers divided by the number of seats. And we want to take the ceiling of this because this is gonna tell us the number of cars that we're gonna need. And I think in Python, you also need to declare this an integer or cast this into an integer because even though this value should evaluate to an integer, it might be declared like as a decimal like 4.0 or something like that, at least in Python. So this value though, which is an integer, and it's the number of cars that we have, which is also equal to the number of fuel it would take this many cars to go one edge, which is why we can just take this and add it to our result. And that is more or less the entire code. Now there's a couple things I want to fix. When we're returning the total number of passengers, we're getting the passengers from all of our children, but we also have to consider the original node itself. And the reason I'm gonna be adding that down here is because we don't want that to factor into our result calculation because we're calculating how much fuel it would take for these passengers to reach this node. It's not gonna take any fuel for this node to reach itself. So that's why we're adding this at the end. Now, lastly, let's actually call our DFS. It's pretty easy to forget to do that. So calling our DFS, starting at the root node, which is zero and its parent, I guess we can just give a value like negative one because none of the nodes are gonna have a value of negative one. So this is the entire code. Now let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. If this was helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon.